In this section of notes, we are only going to get through the physical geography. We're going to take our time with it. We're going to look at the land and the sea, focusing on the peninsulas, islands, and seas, and then kind of looking at the ring of fire. And then we're going to move on to the mountains, the highlands, and the lowlands. We're going to look at the different river systems and the importance they've played. And then we're going to look at the natural resources, the plethora of natural resources, and how that economic activity is changing in East Asia. Physical geography of East Asia. First thing we're going to look at is the land and sea. The People's Republic of China, also known as just China, is 80% of the land area in East Asia. This country is the second most populated country in the world, behind India, of course. And then in the same region, you have Mongolia, which is 13% of East Asia's land, and it is the first most sparsely populated country in the world. Population density is the lowest in the world. Peninsulas, islands, and seas. First one I want to look at is the South China Sea. The South China Sea is located south from Taiwan to the Philippines and the peninsula of southeastern Asia. And you can see it circled in red um, there on your map. The South China Sea carries one-third of the world's shipping traffic. A lot of importation and exportation, especially a lot of exportation, is going on in the South China Sea. Moving on to the Korean Peninsulas. Got them circled in yellow there. The Korean Peninsula juts southeast from China's Manchurian Plain, separating the Sea of Japan from the Yellow Sea. This consists of mainly mountains surrounded by coastal plains. And then we move on to Japan. Japan is what's known as an archipelago. An archipelago is a, an island chain. And this island chain has four large main islands and then, and then thousands of mountainous islands. Your main islands, which you will be responsible for knowing on a map quiz are the island of Hokkaido in the north, Honshu, Shikoku, and Kyushu. And you can see those located and circled in white. I'm going to take my eraser there and erase a little bit because my circling ability failed there. Um, but you can see their location listed there. And then we have a region known as the Ring of Fire. The Ring of Fire is an arc of islands east of China where the Pacific Philippines and the Eurasian tectonic plates meet. There's more than a thousand earthquakes that shake Japan alone every year. And a lot of these, you have underwater earthquakes, which we know as the plates buckle underwater. They create a wave, and as this wave gets closer and closer to the coast, it gets higher and higher, and that wave is known as a tsunami. Um, there's an area in Japan called Fukushima where they had an earthquake and a tsunami in 2011. This tsunami actually caused a nuclear disaster that spread nuclear waste into the ocean. Because of things like this nuclear disaster at Fukushima, people have built these walls, as you can see in this picture here, uh, to block the waves, uh, kind of your average tsunami waves as they come in. Now, of course, if they're really high, the wall's not going to do much, but this modification to the environment to block the sea walls has kind of helped this region. Moving on to mountains, highlands, and lowlands. There's a lot of rugged areas in East Asia, and it's important to note that these rugged areas are very sparsely populated. You have some East Asian mountain ranges which affect the population distribution. For example, you have the Pamirs in western China, located in this region. The Pamirs uh, create a very sparsely populated area in the western lands, meaning not a lot of people live in this area where the Pamirs are located um, because it's mountains and people generally don't like to live in the mountains. And more specifically, you have two mountain ranges within the Pamirs. Let me get my eraser out again. Um, you have the... Kunlun Shan, and then you have the Tian Shan. 
These are both ranges within the Pamir Mountains. And then, of course, don't forget about the Himalaya Mountains, which form a southern border with um, India and Nepal and Bhutan. Um, but those mountain ranges are there as well. And then as well in China, you have some of China's plateaus, basins, and deserts. One, for example, you have the Plateau of Tibet, which again, my circling ability has caused a problem here. But the Plateau of Tibet, you can see it in white, um, is a kind of a flat landed, landed area, which is really, really high. It's the highest plateau region in East Asia, and it's located in the southwestern region of East Asia. Another sparsely populated area uh, in this region is the Taklamakan Desert. And imagine that. My eraser, again, has messed things up. Taklamakan Desert, you can see that here. It is in white now. Here we go. There it's in red. Um, another sparsely populated region. It's a dry and sandy desert. And then you throw in with that the Gobi Desert. And you have a lot of of China where not a lot of people live because you have a lot of rugged landforms and you have very, very dry weather, uh, meaning little to no farming in this region of China. Now moving on to the river systems. China has some very important rivers. One of those is the Yellow River, located in the northern region of China. The Yellow River gets its name from the yellowish-brown silt um, or the yellowish-brown topsoil that it carries. It carries tons of this fine yellowish-brown topsoil called less. Less is not spelled like the opposite of more. There's no in there, but that's how it's pronounced. It is not low S. If you say that in class, shame on you. It's less. You also have uh, one of Central Asia's most important rivers, really the most important river in Central Asia, of the Yangtze. And you can see the Yangtze's location in white. It's Asia's longest river and very, very important area, very, very important river to East Asia. Also in this region, you have the Grand Canal. The Grand Canal is the world's largest artificial waterway. It was begun in the 400 BC, and over the centuries it has been expanded and rebuilt. Um, you can see a zoomed in picture on the right with the same map that we've been using on the left. The Grand Canal would run somewhere there. It connects the Yellow River, as you can see on the one on the right, with the Yangtze River, which is the one here. It connects a very, very important trade route between these major cities with each other in addition to combining these two rivers and connecting the um, exportation and importation uh, of these areas between these two rivers. So a very, very important modification to the environment. Now on to natural resources. This area, as you can see from the economic activity map, has a lot of coal. It also has quite a bit of minerals in, in various countries. But as you can see from China's map, you don't have a whole lot of farming. Only 10% of China is suitable for farming. Korea, 25% of it is suitable for farming, and that entire region of Korea, those peninsulas, only grow rice and barley, even though a lot of it can be farmed. There are other areas have little farming as well, and part of that has to do with just the physical geography and how rugged it is. Uh, and Japan, for example, is just running out of room. you got a lot of people living there and not a lot of space. Other than that, you've got quite a bit of manufacturing and trade, and that is increasing throughout this region. You're seeing more and more of that. But you can kind of see from the economic activity map how the natural resources have dominated the economies throughout the year.